your knees. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word, for this opportunity that we have to uh, look at this issue of the Paul scenes and the preserved text. And we pray that as we go through this information and material that we'll uh, be mindful, as always, to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I'm fighting a couple different things here, okay? Number one, I'm fighting the fact that you've just eaten. So some of you are maybe going to be falling asleep. Hopefully I don't put you to sleep. And the second thing that's not helping is the lights are dimmed so that you can see the screen. So if you have two co the combo there of just having eaten and the lights being dimmed, hopefully it doesn't spell disaster for the study. Um, if you want to follow along with the study, I know some of you have cell phones, devices, or whatever. All of the notes I'm going to go through are on my website. If you go to gracelifebiblechurch.com and click on pastor's page and scroll down, the top listing will be the 2015 uh, Soldiers Training for Service. And these notes that I'm going to be using here are, are uh, available to you if you want to follow along. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do with this time together? The topic is, is the Paulicians and the preserved text. And what I want to just set out sort of right from the beginning, because this is not going to be a Bible study per se. It's going to be more of a sort of a church history lecture um, on some uh, what I believe to be very, very important information. So basically what I'm going to do with my time is I'm going to try to make two major or general contentions. The first one is that the Paulicians were Pauline dispensationalists. Very similar to you and I, okay? And the second, and I think possibly more important point, is I've come to believe as a result of my studies and research into these things that the Byzantine text type, which contains the multiplicity of Greek manuscript copies that support the King James Bible, I've come to believe as a result of my studies that it was actually preserved by Pauline dispensationalists. So I don't, I mean, some of you, may, this may be new for you, and you're not you're like, well, what are you talking about? Those of you that have maybe been around a while, this, this is a big deal. Because what this, what this means, if I'm right about this, what this means is not only were these brothers um, in line with us to a large degree doctrinally, but they also did one of the most important things in church history, and that's preserve the correct text of the Bible, and, and, and thereby spreading into Europe the, the seeds of the Reformation, and supporting the Bible that we've come to, to know, love, use, and appreciate. So there's a lot of things to consider here. So in order to prove these two main contentions, I'm going to basically make five points. Okay, I'm going to take you through five points. The first point is I want to talk to you about the Pilgrim Church concept. I'll explain what that is in a minute. The second point is I want to go over the standard view of the Paulicians in church history books. So how are they, how are they current, are commonly depicted in church history books? Third, I want to look at some things about who they, actually, who they were, some things about them. Fourth, I want to look at what they believed. And then last, I want to look at the relationship between these brothers and the, 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 the manuscripts that support the King James Bible. I'm calling it here the preserved text because it sounded better for the title. Paul scenes in the preserved text. So just bear with me on that. So let's get going. The Pilgrim Church concept. Okay, the Pilgrim Church concept. The union of church and state was in all times looked upon by many of the Lord's disciples as contrary to his teaching. If you go through church history, you'll see any time that the organized church was uh, possessed the power of the state, it spelled disaster for groups of true Bible believing Christians. Because the state church was able to use their power to, to persecute those with whom they disagreed. When the church had the power of the state, it was able to command and use its force for the suppression of any who dissented from its system or in any way refused uh, to comply with their demands. And you can understand that. If, for those of you that know anything about the history of the Middle Ages, you know that the Roman Catholic Church was the state for well over a thousand years of, of European history, and they did not hesitate in any way to use their power to persecute uh, groups of believers that disagreed with them. Okay, um, The true histories of these groups are very hard to, to discern in some cases, because as it says here in the point, the organized church not only was persecuting them, but was persecuting their writings. When they would, when they would execute the... Uh, the heretics, as they would call them, they wouldn't just execute the heretics. They would also seek to destroy and obliterate their writings. 
So, to a large degree, groups like the Pauluseans have not been allowed to speak for themselves in church history because of the systematic, um, the systematic way that the organized church tried to erase any witness of them in church history. And so the true histories of these groups have been hard to discern. Another point that you need to consider there is not only are they trying to erase their writings, but then they ascribe beliefs to them. They ascribe names and beliefs to them that they did not take or would not have used for themselves. Okay? Now, you understand you can do that, right? If I'm going to not only persecute the people, but I'm also going to seek to destroy their writings, and I'm trying to remove all witness, then now I, as the winner, can basically say and do whatever I want about these people. And so as a result, it's, it's, it's very hard. They, they have not been allowed to speak for themselves, okay, because a lot of their things have been destroyed. They've been, um, uh, they've been fallen out of, um, well, they've, they've been destroyed, they've been burned, and they haven't been able to speak for themselves. And strange doctrines have been ascribed to them, and the idea of them being new or aberrant or strange or weird or heretical is information that is being put upon them by their enemies and those that persecuted them and tried to obliterate their writings. So <clears throat> what their adversaries have written about them then really needs to be taken with a grain of salt because they're not able to speak for themselves. Now, you understand this, right? And you'll see this in a few moments when we look at the next point. Do people say all kinds of things about us that aren't true? Have you ever heard somebody say that you cut out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that you don't believe the whole Bible, that you think there's a different God in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. I mean, you, you're familiar with all these kinds of things, right? These types of charges, false charges, things that just are, frankly, lazy charges from people that don't really care to hear about what we have to say or to look into it, they, these are not new. They've been made all throughout church history by the adversaries of the truth who sought to suppress it who sought to uh, lord over Bible-believing Christians as a result. So as you think about this, think, think about the word Paulusian. Why would you call somebody a Paulusian? You would call them a Paulusian because th of what they believed about Paul, right? So just look at the name here, and the name ought to give you at least a little bit of a tip as to what's going on with this particular group of believers. So we understand that there were always believers that dissented from the organized church. We understand that in their dissent, they were persecuted as heretics by the organized church. We understand that not only the believers, but also their writings were sought to be destroyed. That the things that have been said about them have been said by the winners, and they've written the history. And so therefore, a lot of what's said, you kind of have to read between the lines with respect to some of these things. Now, one of these groups is the Pauluseans. So let's look at how the Pauluseans are treated in church history books. If you know anything about church history in general, you've probably heard of Philip Schaff. Philip Schaff has written what is still viewed today, even over 100 years later, as sort of the quintessential church history volume or set on the matter. Okay? Schaff, in chapter 12 of um, volume 4 of his uh, six-volume church history, Schaff devotes an entire section of the chapter to discussing the, quote, heretical beliefs of the Pauluseans. So listen to why the Pauluseans were heretics, according to Schaff. So I'm going to quote from Schaff now for, just for a moment. He, he mentions four groups. These four groups you've never heard of, but I'm going to read them to you for a reason, okay? He mentions the monoliths, the adoptionists, the predestinarians, and the bergerans. And he says that they moved within limits, the limits of the Catholic Church and dissented from it in only one doctrine and are interwoven with the development of Catholic orthodoxy. So if you, what's he saying? He's saying that those groups are okay because if, Rome, if the Roman orthodoxy is here, those four groups only disagreed in one point. So therefore, they're what? They're all right. Okay. Then he, he goes on to say, but there were also radical heretical sects which mixed, Christi mixed Christianity with heathen notions, disavowed all connection with the historic church, and set themselves up against it as rival communities. So that's basically the pilgrim church concept that we just went over. Second quote. He also says, in reference to the Pauluseans, he says, they were essentially dualistic, like the ancient Gnostics and Manichians, 
and hence their Catholic opponents called them by the convenient name of Numenetians, though the system of the Paulicians has more affinity with that of Marcion. Now, I want, to, I want you to notice something there in what I said. It's important to know why Schaff views the Paulicians as heretical, okay? Number one, he's judging who is heretical and who is not based upon where they stand in light of, quote, Catholic orthodoxy. So the, the organized sacerdotal system of the Roman church is viewed as orthodoxy, and anybody that was deviated from that is therefore what? A heretic. You should be happy you're heretics. Okay? He also, second, he considers Catholic orthodoxy, quote, historic Christianity. And third, he proves Broadbent's point that, and that's who we got the Pilgrim Church concept from, that dissenting groups were labeled by their opponents. There's four or five terms there. He calls them Gnostic, he calls them Manichian, he calls them dualistic, and he calls them Marcionite. And these are names that they had not chosen for themselves, and these are names that are ascribed to the Paulicians by church historians because they're getting their information from those that persecuted the Paulicians and called them by these particular names. So I think what you're seeing here is if, if we are going to judge, I don't think there's anybody in this room that would, that would advocate that we judge who's heretical and who isn't based upon the standard of Rome. If that's the standard of who's heretical, then we're all, everybody, everybody that disagrees with Rome is heretical, right? So there's a, a guy who wrote a book not long ago in the 90s. It's called, Will the Real Heretics Please Stand Up? And what the, what the premise of the book is, he, what the guy's doing is he's judging who's heretical or not in church history in relationship to where they stand with the church fathers. Have you read the church fathers? If you haven't read the church fathers, at some point, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it, they're definitely interesting to read because you see just how far and how fast the truth was lost and, 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 and abandoned uh, after the death of Paul and even before the death of Paul, like we read in the, in the verse I led off with here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. So we have a real issue here then with anybody, at least I have an issue with anybody who's going to say that the orthodox groups are those that are in line with Rome and anybody that disagrees with Rome is heretical. I object to that scripturally on so many levels we don't even have time to get into all of them, Right. But you understand, when you read church history books and they're calling the Paulicians heretics, they're calling them her heretics because they are outside of the parameters of, quote, historic Christianity, i.e., Roman Catholicism. Just as an aside, um, in the Grace History Project, I taught three lessons on the evolution of the Catholic Church. And what I did is I demonstrated... Okay. I demonstrated by looking at the three successive generations of church fathers that the entire Roman system was already established within three generations of the death of Paul. So this is happening early, this is happening fast, and it is widespread in its effect. Schaff goes on to state that... Are we good? Oh, all right. It's the first time I've heard that. <laughs> Schaff goes on to say the doctrines and practices of the Paulicians are known to us only from the reports of their orthodox opponents. He admits it. He admits that the only reason you should judge them as heretical is because their opponents said so. Now, what would, what would happen if we took that as our standard today? Do we have lots of opponents out there on the religious landscape that don't like right division? That don't like Pauline right division? that maybe they're okay with Acts 2 or some other form of dividing, but they're not necessarily in line with us. He goes on to call, he goes on to say that the Paulicians were a strange mix of dualism, doceticism, mysticism, and pseudo-Paulinism. Whatever that means. So how do Schaff, and they continually want to compare him to Marcion. So why does Schaff call the beliefs of the policy in pseudo-Paulinism, and why do they constantly want to uh, brand him as a Marcionite? Well, first reason, why, so why does Schaff, got ahead of myself, sorry about that. 
So allegedly, here's what Marcion believes. So I'm going to read this stuff to you, and then I'm going to ask you some questions. Number one, Marcion believed that the God of the Old Testament loved the Jews exclusively. Marcion rejected the entire Old Testament and also those New Testament writings that he thought favored Jewish readers. For example, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He also rejected other Christian writings that appeared to compromise his own views, including 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. Now, where are they getting that information from? Are they getting that from Marcion? Or are they getting it from stuff people have said about Marcion? Okay? So if they're getting that information about stuff people have said about Marcion, that's the same thing as somebody taking secondhand information from somebody in our day about what we believe and accepting it as what? True, just because somebody said it. Okay? Second, second point. In the end, Marcion's Bible allegedly contained an altered version of Luke and ten letters of Paul. The apostle of the Gentiles, it seems, was the apostle who did not corrupt the gospel of Jesus. So Marcion's a heretic because he believed that Paul preached accurately and correctly the gospel of Christ. Do you know anybody that believes in accurately preaching the gospel of Christ? Just wondering, because I, I know some people like that. Third, writing... Now, this is what Irenaeus says. Writing around 180 AD, Irenaeus states the following regarding Marcion's beliefs. He said, with regard to those who allege... Now listen, that Paul alone knew the truth, and that to him the mystery was manifested by revelation, let Paul convict himself. Marcion, what Irenaeus is saying is that Marcion believed that that Paul had a revelation of a mystery committed unto him. Do you know anybody that believes that? Next, Tertullian from 207 A.D. uh, writes the following regarding the Marcionites. The Marcionites allege that Marcion did not so much as innovate on the rule of faith by his separation of the law and the gospel but sought to restore it after it had been previously adulterated. So what he's saying is that Marcion viewed himself not as doing necessarily anything new, but trying to bring things back to the way they should be, with understanding a distinction between the law and the gospel. Tertullian also said, it's also said by Tertullian, that Marcion's beliefs regarding Paul in the, next, in the next three passages were written against Marcion who exalted Paul above the twelve apostles. What a heretic. So why is Marcion a heretic? Marcion is a heretic because he believes that a mystery was committed to Paul, that he exalted Paul above the twelve apostles. Again, do you know, do you know anybody that believes these things? Okay. Bruce Shelley, author of Church History in Plain Language, reports the following regarding his Marcion's, Marcion's views of the Apostle Paul. He says, quote, Marcion's, Marcion's worship of Paul was little short of idolatry. You ever been accused of worshiping Paul? As he saw it, Paul was the great enemy of the law and the great spokesman for the gospel. He was, in fact, a supreme figure in the church. Marcion believed that Christ had descended from heaven twice, once to suffer and to die, and once to call Paul and to reveal to Paul the true significance of his death. You know anybody that believes that? Okay. In heaven, said Marcion, and I don't know whether he actually said this, but... Marcion said, Paul sits at the right hand of Christ, who sits at the right hand of God. And Tertullian also said that Paul had become the apostle of the heretics. In my view, I will add a slight caution here. I do think, you know, there's a little bit of, we need to, you know, be somewhat cautious here when passing judgment on Marcion. But if the things the church fathers say about Marcion are very similar to the things our critics say about us today in in the time we're living in, okay, 
So things like what? We worship Paul, that we do all the, that we cut and mutilate our Bible, that we throw half the Bible out, we don't read the Old Testament, we don't think the gospel should be in the Bible, that we worship Paul and all this sort of thing. The same things that are said about us today in 2015 were the exact same things that were said about Marcion in early on in church history. And if you start looking at what's being said and thinking through it and realizing that all these things are being said by Marcion's enemies, you start to, you start to develop a picture that if you're going to judge it not by the organized Roman church, but if you're going to judge it by the Scripture, that maybe Marcion wasn't such a bad guy after all. Okay? So the only reason we should consider the Paulicians heretics, according to church history books, is because they disagreed with Catholic orthodoxy. Furthermore, the only proof we have, according to Schaff, is the testimony of Catholics with whom the Paulicians disagreed. We could say more here. I've got some more points here, but I'm going I'm to skip over them because I think, at this, I think you get the point, right? I think you get the point that the Paulicians are not viewed favorably in church history books largely because the, all the church, the church history authors are judging who's heretical and who's not based upon the organized system of Rome. And thereby, anybody that dissents or does not agree with that is, is labeled a heretic. Andrew Miller agrees with Broadbent. Miller states the following regarding the Paulicians, quote, the doctrines, character, and history of the Paulicians have been subjects of great controversy, but they have not been allowed to speak for themselves to posterity. Their writings were carefully destroyed by the Catholics, and they are known to us only through the reports of bitter enemies who branded them as heretics. So I think we're, developed, we're, we're seeing a picture here, okay? The Paulicians are one of these pilgrim church groups that was against the Roman Empire. So I got ahead of myself. Who were the Paulicians? The name, from, the time, from very early in church history, groups of believers called themselves Christians. Now, you, you're familiar with that term, right? You understand that in Antioch, they called themselves what? Christians, okay? And the, the guys that did that, were they, they, were follower, they were converts of whose ministry? Paul. So from very on, they call themselves Christians. And that term was used to distinguish themselves from those who called themselves or viewed themselves as, quote, Romans. And they have always been accused of being Manichians. They've always been accused of having these. The name, the name Paulicean is frequently given to uh, churches of these believers. Uh, the persecutions to, uh, to which they were subjected and the systematic destruction of their literature hide from us all but occasional glimpses into their history though what remains is sufficient to show that there were in those wide regions of Asia Minor, Armenia, around Mount Ararat, and beyond the, Euph uh, the Euphrates, churches who kept the teaching of the apostles, received from Christ, and contained the Scriptures in an unbroken testimony to the first. Now, I've bolded this because I want you to see where they're at. Geographically, where are the Paulicians located? They're located in Asia Minor, Armenia, around the area of Mount Ararat, and beyond the Euphrates River, all right? So I've, I've, we've, I've put up a map here. If you look at Paul's apostolic journeys, I've just taken this map of the ancient world, and I've identified with references and arrows areas that we know Paul went on his different apostolic journeys. We know they established churches in Syria and Cilicia. We know he was in Galatia. We know he was in Phrygia. We know these things from the New Testament, right? Well, what area is that? Is that Asia Minor? Shake your head yes. Okay, that, that's Asia Minor. Where were the Paulicians at? They're in the territory of the areas where Paul went on his apostolic journeys, okay? So these, these groups of Paulicians are in the same general geographic area. Mount Ararat is in Turkey, right? The Euphrates River isn't on the map, but it's, it's, it's off here on the, in, in Mesopotamia. So what I'm trying to get you to see is if you look at where Paul went, okay, and you overlay where Paul went with where we know the Paulicians were, guess what we see? We see a common geographic area that Paul went to and that there's groups that have been identified as Paul seeing. Everybody, everybody with me on that? So they're coming from a similar geographic region and area. All right? So between the, for our purposes this morning, it's not morning anymore, is it? 
Between the 17th and 10th centuries, the Paulicians experienced waves of systematic persecution. So in, in 653, after the Muslim conquest of Syria, an Armenian deacon returning from captivity among the Muslims became the guest of a man named Constantine in a village of uh, Manalus near Sermosa. Now, the reason that's important is that Constantine, as a result of the hospitality that is demonstrated to him, the deacon gives him a manuscript containing the four Gospels and the Epistles of Paul. Now, there's all sorts of legendary uh, information and rumors here about, about this guy Constantine and so forth. Let's be clear, this is not Constantine the Great that uh, legalized the Roman church and stopped the persecution of Christians um, in, in, the, in the fourth century. That's not who we're talking about. This is a different guy. Oh, there's all sorts of rumors. But he takes this manuscript that he got of the four Gospels and the Epistles of Paul, and he starts to study it, and he renounces his religious past, and he uh, sets about to restore apostolic Christianity. And what he actually does is he changes his name from Constantine to Silvanius, after Silas, okay, Paul's companion. And he begins preaching for nearly 30 years in a place, a place called Kerbosa, Armenia. And Sylvanius had many converts from among the Catholics as well as Zoroastrians. And over time, this group became sizable enough to attract the attention of the emperor. <laughs> Not good, right? When they attract the attention of the emperor in 684 A.D., an edict is issued against Constantine and the Paulician co uh, congregations, and the execution of the, de of the decree was entrusted to an officer of the imperial court named Simeon. And he had orders to put the teacher to death and to distribute his followers amongst the Catholic clergy. So he's got, he's got an edict from the Byzantine emperor to go out and crush this guy Sylvanius and his followers, and once he's killed the leader, to take all the followers and distribute them out there amongst the various ranks within the Catholic clergy. That's, that's what the edict calls for. Um, so he has, he has the edict to do this. Simeon, or so, Simeon plays Constantine, the chief object of the priest's revenge, before a large number of his companions and commanded them to stone him. So what they do is they take the leader and they set him up in front of all the people that he's been teaching and they, give him, they arm him with stones and they say, kill him. Okay? All of them dropped the stones but one guy. A, um, a, a guy named Justice, his own adopted son, takes a stone, kills him. Okay? Now, this guy, Simeon, that was issued by the emperor to, to enact the edict and, and, and take care of the situation, it turns out he is so emotionally affected by all this that he witnessed here that after about three years in the imperial court, he actually leaves the court. He goes back to Kerbosa, adopts the name Titus, and becomes the successor of Sylvanius and starts teaching these people. That he had been given orders to what? To kill. So five years after the... By the way, this artwork, this is, this is artwork that was done to depict the, the, one of the persecutions against the Paulicians. There are, there are other pieces of art here, too, that, were, that are done from the Middle Ages about some of these things. So this is not something that is, like, you know, totally hidden from view if you look hard enough for it. So uh, where am I at here? After five, after five years after the martyrdom of Constantine, justice betrayed the Paulicians again. So the guy that killed his adopted father, Sylvanius, he betrays him again. And he went to the bishop of Colonia and reported the revival and spread of the so-called heresy. And the bishop communicated information to Emperor Justinian II. And in consequence, Simeon and a large number of his followers were burnt to death in a large funeral pile. Richard was going over some of that stuff this morning. And I, I knew what I was going to be talking to you about. And you talk about enduring some stuff. These guys endured some stuff. They endured the worst type of intentions against them here um, when, when you think about what happened. The Paulicians, as well as similar groups, rejected the use of icons. I'm just curious. How many of you have heard of the movement in church history called the iconoclastic movement? You remember that? Craig, Craig remembers that? The iconoclastic movement was a movement in the Eastern Empire 
for a while to do away with all icons. So the Virgin Mary, the Rosary, any icons in worship, there was a time when an emperor was ruling the, the, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire that was anti-icons, if you will, and actually ordered for them to be destroyed. Well, during the reign of this person, the Paulicians are largely left alone. They're, they're largely allowed to sort of do what they want, and they're, they're left alone for a large part of the time during the iconoclastic controversy. So because of their rejection of icons, they received a bit of a reprieve from their persecution under the reign of Leo uh, the Assyrian, who in 726 issued the first edict against the worship of images. So that, they, they do okay for a while when the iconoclastic movement is, is in power in the, emperor, but if, in the empire. excuse me. But eventually that ends. And in 842, Empress Theodora, who is a supporter of images, reinstitutes image worship and goes after the Paulicians pretty severely and pretty uh, significantly. She, does, she was determined to exterminate the so-called heretics who had consistently and powerfully proclaimed that icons, images, pictures, and relics were valueless and had maintained a spiritual worship and believed in the priesthood of all believers. So the Paulicians rejected all this stuff, Okay. They were left alone when the ruling authorities also rejected icons. But as soon as the Empress Theodora comes to power, who, is it, who believed in using the icons, she is going to go after them quite ferociously. The systematic slaughter, beheading, burning, drowning began afresh under Empress Theodora's orders and continued for many years, but it failed to shake the steadfastness of the believers. It was claimed, now listen, it was, beclaim, it was claimed that between 842 and 867 that Theodora and her inquisitors killed over 100,000 Paulicians, okay? And even, even our boy Ruckman, that was sarcastic. Broadbent and Ruckman both report that the Paulicians politically and militarily aligned themselves for a time with the Muslims due to the ferocity of the persecutions against them by the established church. So, they, in other words, they knew what they were up against with those guys. So when the Muslims came along and were trying to conquer Byzantine lands, for at least for a little while, the Paulicians thought, well, we know what we're dealing with here. Maybe if we side up with these guys for a while, we'll at least be able to do what we want and worship as we please. So you have all sorts of very, very interesting things here happening on a historical level. Volume 3 of his legendary uh, book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Edward Gibbon states the following regarding the Paulicians. Three different roads might introduce the Paulicians into the heart of Europe. Under the Byzantine standard, the Paulicians were transported to the Greek provinces of Italy and Sicily in peace and war, They freely conversed with strangers and natives, and their opinions were silently propagated in Rome, Milan, and kingdoms beyond the Alps. It was soon discovered that many thousand Catholics of every rank and of either sect sect had sects, excuse me, men and women, had embraced the Paulician teaching, and the flames which consumed twelve canons of Orleans were first were first enact in a signal of persecution. Folks, you don't want to know something. How many? If you know anything about history, you know that Edward Gibbons, Edward Gibbons' series, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, is still the master, viewed as still the master work on the fall of the Roman Empire. He's got an entire chapter in that book on the Paulicians. He cannot write, Gibbon cannot write the history of the decline of the Roman Empire without an entire chapter on these guys. Okay? They are, they are far more significant than you might realize. The visible assemblies of the Paulicians, or Albigensians as they were otherwise referred to, were extirpated by fire and sword, and the bleeding remnant escaped by flight, concealment, or Catholic conformity. The options they have are to run, to stand there and die, or compromise. Okay, or compromise. 
But the invincible spirit with which, which, which they had kindled still lived and, brought, and breathed in the Western world, in the state, in the church, and even in the cloister. Now listen, a latent succession was preserved of the disciples of St. Paul, who protested the tyranny of Rome, embraced the Bible as the rule of faith, and purified their creed from all visions of Gnostic heresy. Interesting guys. In 1895, a book was written called The, Inspira the Inspiration and Accuracy of the Holy Scriptures, and it says this about the Paulicians. In one quarter alone did, they scatter, did, did the scattered ashes grow bright under the Spirit's breath. Paul had spent his strength in planting and watching over the churches in Asia Minor. His toil was neither fruitless nor forgotten. Paul-like men, that's what they're calling him, Paul-like, Pauline, Paul-like men were hailed as such by their contemporaries and became known by the Greek name Paulicoli. Followers of who? Paul were stirred amid the growing need to imitate the apostle to the Gentiles in his zeal and self-sacrifice for threatened truth and endangered souls. Now listen, this is a key line. They wrote and multiplied copies of the Scripture, especially of the Pauline epistles. Who's in Byzantium copying manuscripts? The Paulicians. They're, they're, so when we talk about, in, in the school, when Richard talks about the doctrine of preservation and the doctrine of preservation being conducted through the multiplicity of accurate, reliable copies that are just as authoritative as the original and how that's what the doctrine of preservation should cause you to look for. And they, we, we have, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm excited about it. You, you, you talk about the Byzantine text type being the text that supports the King James Bible. Who's in Byzantium to preserve the text? Paulicians, people that believe similar things to who? You and I. Skipping ahead for the sake of time. The historian meets the Paulicians again, <coughs> excuse me, in communities and people that lived apart in which Rome stamps out one by one. But the truth they preserved lived on and burst forth at last in the splendors of the Reformation. Now look, who are the Paulicians? They're this group from Asia Minor. They're persecuted. They're dispersed into Europe. Once they're dispersed into Europe, they spread all over Europe and they settle in all these, in all these regions. And as they go, what are they taking with them? They're taking the scriptures with them that they've copied that originated down here in the Byzantine Empire. And they're taking them with them. They're transplanted across the Bosphorus here into the Balkan regions, and they become known. They become known as the Bogomils. And from there, they spread and matriculate all throughout Europe. And then they eventually are going to concentrate themselves here, and are going to be the seeds of what becomes the Protestant Revolution. So, the Bogomils believe uh, beloved of God are the link to the Paulicians. They're in Bulgaria. They are put there by the emperor. The empire eventually says, we're wasting too much time killing them. Let's just move them. So they round them all up and they move them across the Bosporus Straits. They put them out in the back of beyond and say, there, have at it. Well, that from there, they disseminate their, their, their teaching and their thinking and their manuscripts and stuff all throughout the rest of Europe as a result of that move. So spanning a period of time from about 600 A.D. until the 14th century, with a few lingering into the 18th century, Gibbon considered the Paulicians the first reformers who scattered over, this, over the West the seeds of the Reformation. Edward Gibbon, secular historian, as he looks at the Paulicians, he says, these are the guys that planted in Europe the seeds of the Reformation. Okay? These are also the guys from the testimony of the other author that are interested in copying out what? Scriptures. So let's look at a little bit more about their beliefs. The Paulicians. I've got some more stuff here from Schaff, but I'm not going to read all of it. Well, 
allegedly, they were dualists, okay? They said that the good God created the world and the bad God created the sensual, uh, the, sorry, the good God created the spiritual world, the bad God created the, central, the sensual world. The former is worshipped by the Pauluseans, i.e. true Christians. They, it, it, st- it said they had contempt for matter, that they practiced docetism, that they rejected Mary as the mother, they rejected the worship of Mary as the mother of God. And they also rejected the Old Testament and the epistles of Peter, according to Shah. They regarded Peter as a false prophet because he denied his master, proclaimed or preached Judaism rather than Christianity, was the enemy of Paul and the pillar of Catholic hierarchy. That's what Shah's saying about him. So, therefore, they're what? Listen, we can't have people denying Mary worship. We just can't have that. Because if we have that, they're clearly what? Heretics. We can't have anybody denying that Peter was the first pope of Rome. We can't have that because clearly if they deny that, they're what? They're heretics. So, again, Schaff is saying that they're heretics simply with where they stand with respect to Catholic orthodoxy. Okay? But now comes the real reason why... Catholics and Roman Catholic sympathizing Protestants like Schaff consider the policy in heretics. Quoting Schaff, they rejected the priesthood, the sacraments, the worship of the saints, the sign of the cross, all externals in religion. Baptism means only the baptism of the Spirit. The communication with the, the body and blood of Jesus Christ is only a communion with the Word and God. So they reject the Catholic Eucharist. Why are they really heretics? Notice, though, why are they really heretics? Because they reject water baptism. You ever notice you can believe anything you want, and everybody will leave you alone. But as soon as you reject water baptism, everyone's on you like crazy. Okay? Regarding the Paulsian belief... About baptism, Edward Gibbon writes, in practice, or at least in theory, of the sacraments, the Pauluseans were inclined to abolish all visible objects of worship. And the words of the gospel were, in their judgment, the baptism and communion of the faithful. They're they're not practicing any form of organized, outward, external what? Baptism. In Volume 3 of Neander's Church History, we learn the following. He says, Indeed they went so far on the side to wholly reject the outward celebration of all the sacraments. They maintained that it was by no means Christ's intention to institute the baptism by water as a perpetual ordinance, but by baptism they meant only the baptism of the Spirit. You know anybody else that believed that? Just wondering. They rejected, he goes on to say, they rejected outward baptism. So they seem to have rejected altogether the outward celebration of the Lord's Supper, water baptism, all of the Catholic sacraments, probably understanding that the Lord's Supper was spiritually and symbolically representative of the believer's communion with Christ. So they're rejecting all of those aspects of the Roman Empire. And even, even Ruckman has to admit in his church history book, he says the following, he's forced to concede. The real problem with the Pauluseans is they rejected the Catholic, is not that they rejected the Catholic priesthood and the Catholic sacraments and, worship, and the worship of relics and crosses, but that they reject, but that they taught the one baptism of Ephesians 4 5 was the Holy Spirit putting the believer into Christ. You can almost hear him just screaming while he writes this. <laughs> and then he said, but that, that's not the best part. Then he says. They were the Stamites and the Bullingerites of their day. And at worst, they were at least five times as scriptural as any bishop or archbishop in the ruling church. Okay? That, so he, he, even, even when Ruckman, who does not like us at all, by the way, when he looks at the situation, he goes, hey, these are the, if you want, these are the guys in church history that are the Stamites and the Bollingerites and so on and so forth. And he says, even at their worst, they're uh, five times more scriptural than anybody in that church was. In his 1908 book, I'm, getting, I'm sorry, I am not keeping you up to date with this. 
All right, so we'll forget that for now. In 1908, the Inquisition, a book was written called The Inquisition, a critical and historical study of the coercive power of the church by a guy named Van Card. And he connects the so-called Catherine heresy to the Paulicians. To the Catharii, uh, the following belief is ascribed. Baptism of water was to them an empty ceremony as valueless as the baptism of John. Gibbon reports that Constantine Sylvanius attached himself with particular devotion to the writings and character of St. Paul. You know anybody that does that? The epistles of Paul made a deep impression on his mind and, and had a new direction to the thoughts and to his life. So wrote August Neander of Constantine Sylvanius. Neander also, by the way, Neander is a German writing in Germany. So if I go back to the map, Germany is in just this general area here. He's writing in the late, in the late 16, early 1700s, and his church history book is translated into English in the 1800s. So he's writing in a, in a geographic area that has a little bit more free access to some of this information. This is what Neander says about the Paulicians. He said they strove to derive their doctrine from the New Testament and particularly from the writings of Paul. You know anybody that does that? Second... It was, it was by a Christianity drawn from the writings of St. Paul that the Paulicians were, from this time onward, bent on bringing about a renovation of the church, a restoration of the pure apostolic doctrine. Third, the Paulicians gave special weight to the authority of the Apostle Paul. And his epistles must have been considered by them as the main sources and knowledge of Christian doctrine. Do you know anybody that believes that? In October 1901, edition of the Things to Come journal, E.W. Bollinger wrote an article on the Paulicians titled, The Paulicians, A Lesson from the Past in which he connects the Paulicians with the Pauline dispensational movement of his day. And by the way, I might add, based upon my research, in 1901 when he writes this, I believe that Bullinger is still Acts 13 in 1901. He said the following, quote, But all through the ages God has had his people who cherished his truth and witnessed for him. Known by different names at different times and in different places, scattered abroad singularly, in small companies or in communities, they kept the faith. One of the most noted examples of these was uh, who struggled, excuse me, against the advancing heathen darkness as it gradually overspread the church is found in the people known as Paulicians. And then he says at the end of the article, he says, by whatever name we may, by whatever name we, referring to himself, may be called or known, we are in witnessing for the teaching of God in the Pauline epistles, the true successors of the ancient Paulicians, holding aloft the same banner, holding forth the same word, and holding fast the same truth. You understand what that means? That means when Bollinger looked at the Paulicians, he said, of all the guys in church history, those are my guys. Those are the guys I identify with. I identify with those guys who tied themselves to the epistles and teaching of the Apostle Paul. And he says, he says to, the, to his readers in 1901, he says, this is how we need to view ourselves. We need to view ourselves as the successors of these guys. Holding, what does he say? Holding aloft the same banner, holding forth the same word, and holding fast the same truth. Bollinger viewed himself as carrying on the legacy of the ancient Paulicians, and I believe we should too. Now, the, let's get to the, the really good part. This is all good. I don't know what, how you feel about it. Maybe I'm just a boring church history teacher at this point to you. I hope that's not the case. But what we're going over is, you know what this is? This is a grace apologetic. That's what that is. How many times somebody come to you and say, well, where were you guys in church history? Where were you? That's where we were. We're there. We're knowable, we're discernible, we're there, we're, we're, we're a big part of what was going on. But you need to know that, so that when that smart aleck person comes and says, where were you in church? There we were, there we were, right there. Read them and weep, son. <laughs> the preserved text, 
Since the inception of Grace School of the Bible in 1983, Brother Jordan taught in manuscript evidence class <coughs> that God's design was to preserve His Word through a multiplicity of accurate, reliable copies that are just as authoritative as the originals. Historically, the majority witness demanded by the biblical doctrine of preservation is found in what textual critics have called the Byzantine text type. Okay? So what this map is showing you are the so-called four text types. Okay? The Byzantine, the Caesarean, the Alexandrian, and the Western. And so they're, they're kind of placed in their strategic areas of where they would show up on a map. All right? Now, according to D.A. Carson, author of the King James Bible Debate, A Plea for Realism, the Byzantine text is the traditional text which in large measure stands behind the King James Version. It was largely preserved in the Byzantine Empire, which, uh, which continued to use Greek, unlike the Western Roman Empire and its offshoots. By the way, I just have to say, that's a fascinating point, isn't it? For all of the emphasis that all the so-called textual critics want to put, put on Greek, why are they using Western Roman manuscripts? When the, when, thank you. When the Western Roman Empire went away from Greek. They weren't even using Greek. They were using what? Latin. Anyway, get frustrated about this stuff. It was largely preserved in the Byzantine Empire, which continued to use Greek. I just said that. There are, there are far more manuscripts extent, that means available, in this tradition than in the other three combined. But on the other hand, most of these manuscripts, manuscript witnesses are relatively late. Right? So the problem is they're not early witnesses. It doesn't matter that there's thousands of them that all agree amongst themselves in 98 point whatever percent of the readings. The problem is they're just not old enough. By the way, that's crazy. You know, you know how I know that's crazy? How do you know that what you how do you know when it comes to reconstructing the text of your Bible that what you don't want to look for is the oldest one? You want to know how you know that? Come with me to 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter two. How long have I been teaching? Forever, thanks, Des. <laughs> second, second, I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Okay, so you can bear with me for about another half hour, forty hour, hour and a half. No, I'm just kidding. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse seventeen. How do you know? that you don't want to just arbitrarily look for the old one. I'll show you right here. Here's your answer. Verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Folks, just because a manuscript is old doesn't prove anything. Because they're already corrupt in the Word of God before Paul's even done writing it. So if you're going to arbitrarily tell me that the way I should go about reconstructing the text is to find the oldest manuscripts, if I'm going to adopt a scriptural mindset of how to think about the situation, that verse right there tells me that's wrong. You following that? It's wrong. And oh, by the way, what about all the versions that predate so-called oldest and best manuscripts, the translations that agree with the text of Receptus and the King James. What about that? See, what you're doing, look, I understand, as, a, as somebody that has a master's degree in history, I understand that if I'm trying to reconstruct Plato's Republic, okay, from a human standpoint and human viewpoint, does it make sense to go back and find the oldest one? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, right? But I'm not dealing with Plato's Republic, I'm dealing with the Word of God. So I need to adopt a position about how to do that that's in line with what that book says about itself. That's the point, right? So to say to me that I'm just going to go back and find the oldest Greek manuscript, number one, that's putting all of the weight on the Greek alone, which isn't wise when all, there's translations going out in all sorts of other languages that predate the so-called oldest and best. And if I'm going to adopt that, that's bad history, because what it's saying is I'm going to take an entire set of, historic, of historical documents that speak to what I'm trying to do, and I'm just going to dis, disclude them right out of the gate because they're not the right kind of manuscripts. That's dumb. I'm sorry. It's not smart. It's not, it's not, look, 
It's not even good, dare I say, scholarship. The majority text <laughs> is a term you might hear used. And when you hear that term, what it's basically saying is it's referring to the manuscripts of the Byzantine text type or Greek manuscripts what? Alone. When you hear the term textus receptus, what you're dealing with there is you're dealing with the same what? You're dealing with the same Greek manuscripts, but you also are adding early translations, patristic quotations and lectionaries, and the end result of that is what? The King James Bible. Okay? So I, I just want you to understand what you're taught. When you hear people use these terms, what they technically mean. Because I've been guilty of it myself, just sort of sloppily saying majority text, text receptus, using them interchangeably. And what I'm referring to when I do that is where is that multiplicity of copies at that preservation demands. But technically, if you're being real precise about it, that's really not, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. You need to be more, more precise about it. Now, looking at my notes, I'm going to skip some stuff, and I'm going to quote for you some stuff from James White, the author of the King James Controversy. He says the following, The Byzantine text type is found consistently in the area around Byzantium. The Byzantine text type represents the vast majority of Greek manuscripts we have available to us today. He also says the Byzantine text type is not found in full form until the 4th century and does not become the majority until the 19th century. Geographically, we can compare the number of Alexandrian manuscripts to the Byzantine manuscripts. And if we were to graph the total number of manuscripts, the Byzantine, the, um, the Byzantine text would dwarf the Alexandrian. Okay, so let's look at that. So this is a chart comparing Alexandrian manuscripts with Byzantine manuscripts, okay? Alexandrian are in blue, Byzantine are in red, and this only runs from the 2nd through the 9th century. So if we added out further to the other side, the numbers in red would go up even higher, okay? Historical events have shaped the history of the text in such a way as to make the text, in such a way so that the text found around Byzantium, or the Byzantine Empire, is the majority. The largest number of handwritten manuscripts today is found in the Byzantine text type. But of course, so, so what, what that's saying to you, and then he goes on to say that that is the basis of the TR, the Textus Receptus. It's fundamentally a Byzantine text from whence the King James translators developed their New Testament. So what he's saying is the manuscripts in red speak to the readings found where? In the King James. Despite the claims of modern scholarship, the viewpoint of faith leads one to look for the multiplicity. See, what, what, what he's doing is saying, look, let me show you what James White is, is doing. He's saying, well, yeah, there's more red lines than blue lines. Okay? But the blue lines are what? Older. And because the blue lines are older, they're closer to the original. And because they're older and closer to the original, therefore they must be what? They must be correct. And what must have happened is, as time went on, the ones in red were altered, messed up, screwed up, and everything else. So he's putting all of the weight here when the Scripture would tell you to put all the weight where? Not on age, but on what? Multiplicity, right? Where are they at? So then, so even a guy like James White admits that the Byzantine manuscripts support what translation? So then I have a question. Who's living in Byzantium that has an interest in preserving manuscripts? The Paulicians. Recall the words of church historian John Uthart about the Paulicians, quote, they wrote out and multiplied copies of the scriptures, especially of the Pauline epistles, taking them with them as, the cho as their choicest treasures, the word of God. By the truth they preserved, lived on, 
and burst forth at last into the splendors of the Reformation. Who's in Byzantium that has an interest in copying out and preserving the Bible? The Pauluseans. What do the Pauluseans believe? They believe Paul is their apostle. They believe that the teaching for the church is found in the epistles of Paul alone. They believe that the baptism of the Spirit in Ephesians 4, 5 is the only one that what? matters. They reject the Catholic Church. They reject the sacraments. They reject the entire sacerdotal system of the Roman Empire. And they have a vested interest in preserving manuscripts that support the Bible that you're using. August Neander gives credit for translating and circulating portions of the Scripture uh, amongst the laity. He gives the Pauluseans credit for that. After discussing all the Pauluseans pre presented religion to the people of their day, he says the following about them. He wrote, This was the particular bent of the Pauluseans. Made them better acquainted with the Scriptures. For there can be little doubt that by the means of the Pauluseans, translations of particular portions of Scripture were already circulating amongst the laity. They are into this. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm almost done. Everybody sees these red lines here, right? Do you know what you can do? Notice how when the, when the Byzantine starts to here in the 5th century... Then it goes up in the 6th century, and then it goes down for two centuries. You know what you can do? You can take on this chart all these centuries where you see a decline in the number of manuscripts in the Byzantine text type, and you know what you can do? You can overlay on that chart centuries of known persecution against the Pauluseans. Watch. Remember we talked about this? 1684, the edict is issued against the Pauluseans by Emperor Constantine. 689, Emperor Justinian burns countless numbers of Pauluseans in a huge funeral pile, and what happens to the number of manuscripts? Why? Because they're not just killing the people, they're also destroying their writings. Everybody with that? Next century, under Emperor Leo, we know there's persecution from 717 to 741. We know that you have Emperor Constantine in 741 through 775. We've already talked about this. We're large numbers of Pauluseans. And here is when they start to be transplanted out of Byzantium, across the Bosphorus, into Thrace, onto the other side, into the Balkan area. Okay, But look at what happens to the number of manuscripts in the Byzantine text type when you overlay it with known centuries of persecution against the Pauluseans. It goes what? It goes down. Is that a coincidence? I'm going to say something to you about that, as I, you thought I probably would. <laughs> the reason I believe that the reason there are not more manuscripts in the Byzantine text type, and the reason why there are not possibly more older manuscripts in the Byzantine text type, is because they were destroyed by the organized church as they persecuted their owners. All this leads to the following potential conclusion. Could the reason be there are not more and earlier witnesses in the Byzantine textual tradition be because of widespread persecution against the Pauluseans by the organized church? Now watch what happens. As, <clears throat> so here's what we're talking about. They are transplanted into Thrace. They want to get them out of town. They move them across the Bosphorus. They put them out here. That's the same thing we saw on this map here earlier on. Okay. Now watch what happens to the number of manuscripts in the Byzantine text type after they've been moved out of the empire across the Bosporus. Let's go back. Whoop. Look what happens. The text rebounds and eclipses its highest point at any time previous. Do you think this is a coincidence? I choose not to believe it is. This is, this, what you are seeing here is evidence, historical, textual evidence of preservation. And it's being done by people that believe similar things to you and I. So moving to my conclusion. Look, folks, don't we have this tendency sometimes to want to 
kick the dirt and view ourselves as small and insignificant and all this sort of thing. You know what this tells me? What this tells me is that the Paul sins, people like you and I, are responsible for some of the most important, most significant things that have ever happened in the entire history of the dispensation of grace. Who else is going to do it? Who else is going to preserve the Word of God if not Pauline dispensationalists? Who else is going to do it? The Catholics aren't going to do it. Nobody else is going to do it. For too long, we have viewed ourselves, us, Pauline dispensationalists, as an insignificant minority in church history. In my opinion, I feel this study challenges this commonly held misconception in at least the following four ways. Number one, Pauline dispensationalists stood for Pauline authority from the earliest stages of church history. These folks viewed the Pauline epistles as containing the correct gospel as well as all the precepts of true biblical Christianity. Second, the Pauline's rejected all the Catholic hierarchy and sacraments, including water baptism. And the only baptism that mattered for them was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Third, the Pauline's copied, translated, and disseminated God's Word. As such, they are one of the groups of believers that is chiefly responsible for the preservation of the true text of the New Testament. And not only did these saints reject the ceremonial ceremonial trappings of the Catholic Church, they also rejected the Roman Catholic text. And fourth, the Paulicians, through migration, as a result of persecution, spread throughout Europe the text and the doctrines of the Reformation. Folks, we are far more than some little piddly, insignificant group in church history. Our spiritual forebears did great things. And I agree with Bollinger that we need to take up, we need, we need, to, we need to view ourselves as continuing in that same vein. That's all I got. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. They called themselves Christian. They were called Paulicean by their enemies. Constantine Sylvanius? You're talking about Emperor Constantine? Constantine. Yeah, that's not the same. Yeah, Emperor Constantine, um, it's 325, right? Yeah. 325. Um, I don't remember what, what he said about the Jews per se. Emperor Constantine. The Constantine I was referring to is not Emperor Constantine. If I said that, that was... It contained the Apocrypha between the Testaments. Um, the, they were When they did that, they, the, there's a booklet I wrote about that where... What the King James translators, how they treated the Apocrypha is in line with how previous English translations had dealt with the Apocrypha, including it between the Testaments. If you look at a Catholic Old Testament, the Apocryphal books are spread all throughout. They're mixed in with the rest of what we would consider Old Testament books because they believe they're canon. So the King James translators are just following what had become standard procedure in Protestantism for how to handle the Apocryphal books until eventually they're just taken out. Yeah.
You're talking here? Yeah. Okay, yep. Well, I, I wouldn't know that. Yeah, I, I, I think I understand your question. I, would not, I wouldn't know how to speculate backward other than to simply say that you know they had to be there that whole time because there are translations being made from them into other languages that predate you know, some, of these, some of these old Alexandrian manuscripts. And the fact that you even have any... They're, they're there. They, they clearly were there. How many of them were there or anything like that, I, I, I don't know that I would care to speculate other than to say that we know they were there because of what, is, what we still have surviving. We might not have Greek texts, per se, but we have translations. And not only translations, but patristic quotations. Church fathers in their writing are quoting the New Testament. And a lot of times their, their quotations are matching the readings found in the King James. And they are predating any of the, um, they predate any of the so-called oldest and best manuscripts of the Alexandrian tradition. Yeah. I don't, I, some of you I don't know your name, so I apologize. Okay. Yeah, I've seen that chart in this church history book. He's got the same chart. Yep, I've seen that. Yep. Ted? It starts, it starts being used. Um, well, I can't say exactly. I do know that as of the late 100s and early 200s, Irenaeus and Tertullian are already referring to Paul as the apostle of the heretics. So the terminology Paul is seeing may not have been specifically used, but they were already identifying anybody that was of that way of thinking as being aberrant or standing against Rome's organized system. As early as the late 100s, early 200s, they're already identifying Paul or the followers of Paul as being heretical. So I don't know exactly what year they, they said those guys are Paulicians, but the, 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 the seeds of it are there from very early. You want a total number? Yeah, how many of them there were? I don't have a I don't have a total number. The the most the most concrete number I have is uh, is between is in this is in this century here that there were well over uh, according to um, according to uh, where's my source here? Broadbent says that there were over one hundred thousand that were put to death between eight forty two and eight sixty seven on by Theodora. Over a hundred thousand of them. So obviously that figure could be a lot bigger too, or possibly smaller. But. I, 
I, I, I couldn't say how many. I wish I could, but I, I can't. Oh, lots of questions. Yes, is it Pearl? Oh, thank you. I said that they referred to themselves as Christian. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, I don't, I, I, at a minimum, it means that's what they started to call themselves, it would seem to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can only go by what the verse would say, and I guess that would be the implication, right, that they start calling, yeah. I, I guess I don't see any reason to not think that. So, yeah. I mean, were other people calling them Christians? Oh, oh, oh well, yeah, I, is that what you're saying? I hear, okay. Um, like Paul is saying, he said, if Paul went there, he was there. Yes. And right here, if I do, I know it says what it does. It means what it says. So my understanding, the reason why is because I hear conflict of things. Paul never called himself a Christian. And, and right here in Atlanta, I think it's what Paul is, right? I would say based on that verse that he wouldn't have objected to it. I mean, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Right. And so... The, the, the issue for me as I think about that is that what's going on there is that terminology is not first being applied to the little flock of Israel. Right. It's being applied to a group that has something to do with Paul and Antioch. Right. That to me is That's the significance right. there. Yeah. So they're not, they're not calling the believing remnant in early Acts Christians when the terminology first is used by whoever uses it first, whether it's them or somebody else calling them that. Um, it's, a, it's first described with Antioch. Not Jerusalem. Yeah. Yes, Paul. Well, I think you could say, I think there's a few things you could say. Number one would be persecution. Okay. The other thing would be they're just there's not a lot surviving because they're you know they're they're being used and they're being they're fought it's not that it's not that there weren't any there we know they were there that had those readings in them because of patristic you know you know all these things but they're being used and they fall apart and deteriorate I mean I mean I've got my Bible tape because it's just falling apart right I mean you're talking about handwritten things on papyrus they're gonna they're going to de- deteriorate to a degree. No. I think there's two, there's two issues there for me as I think about it. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm not. I don't know. Number one is nobody's using them. And number two is climate. The climate in Alexandria is a desert climate that is better suited for things not deteriorating so quickly as opposed to other parts of the Mediterranean world. How many of you are aware of the fact they just found a, 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 scra- a, a scrap of Mark's gospel on a mummy? They were, the archaeologists were unwrapping a mummy in Egypt and they found in the, in, the, in the mummification across the skull, they found a scrap of the gospel of Mark. I so hope that's verses 1 and 2. I so hope that's chapter one. And, that, and, it, and it, they, they're saying it's from like 90 A.D. If this is true, this would be the earliest known fragment of any New Testament book. Um, look, I'll say this about it. It'd be awesome if that ended up to be, a, if, we could, if you could document that as a Byzantine reading. 
But even if you can't, that doesn't undermine my belief in the Bible I've got. Okay? So anyway, I appreciate your... i got to get back to Michigan, so thanks for your attention. Have the notes that you were giving out, or what you're going to do about? I didn't bring copy notes, but I told them where they could find it on my way. Oh, you're right, Michelle. All right. Grace, Grace Life if you, if On the pastor's page, you can find all the notes, the things he didn't read, that he did read. Uh, Let me, let me reread you this passage that I read to you earlier today. <clears throat> 